Um, so I, uh, I'm going to come at this. For, I've only seen a handful of the talks, but I think I've got a slightly different spin on um, this discussion. And I want to talk a little bit about, I guess, what, what keeps me up at night. Um, I mean, besides my, my 10-month-old son, who's been keeping me up a little bit more than, than this work. But um, basically what I'm trying to do, what we're trying to do at CUSP, is figure out how to use this new deluge of sensing technologies, data, and of course computing capabilities to make cities better places to live. Uh, we've heard this message quite a bit from technology companies and all kinds of folks, but I think we've got a very different perspective on it in that our work engages directly with the city agencies as, an, as a trusted kind of analytics partner. So we work hand in hand with New York City agencies and we're also taking a little bit of a different perspective on this whole smart city discussion. And I'll talk more about what that specifically means as it relates to this quantified community work that we're doing uh, and which has now extended into, into this discussion of neighborhood labs. Um, and, and I want to start by saying that I have this, all this has got a lot more questions than answers. So I'm not coming in to tell you exactly how well everything is working and show you all kinds of wonderful results. Uh, this is a, a big work in progress. Um, and something that I think we've had some very good conversations with a few design firms, KPF, Arup, but I'd love to see the AEC community get much more involved with this discussion. I think it'll become obvious uh, why. Um, so the premise for, for a lot of this logic is something that anyone who's ever studied cities or uh, been told to read anything about a city has read Jane Jacobs. And it's quite telling that even in her book uh, over 50 years ago, just in the, in the first few pages, you know, implores us to really be thinking about cities as experimental platforms and labs. Um, really thinking about how we could test out new ideas. And this is something that we do without even knowing it. Right? When we put in a pedestrian plaza in Times Square, we're, we're making an experiment. We have no idea at this point what the impact of such, a, uh, such an act might actually be. Um, so there's an opportunity here to think much more concretely and I think much take a lot from the natural and physical sciences in understanding how to develop and design these experiments and our new powers of observation uh, through all of the sensing technologies gives us unbelievable ways of understanding not only the world in which we live but how our, our decisions impact that. So we have some kind of this, this dichotomy of doing work that is very mission driven in terms of trying to solve problems that city agencies are bringing to us and also thinking from a basic science perspective, what is this new urban science? What are the big science and engineering questions that cities present themselves? So I think there's two that, that we'd like to, that, I, that we're kind of honing in on. And first is really, can we, and we'll come back to this, can we understand kind of the pulse of the city? What is normal activity in a city? What, how does it vary when there's a hurricane, when, there's, when the Pope is in town, when there's some other shock? You know, how does this really change? And can we begin to model and understand this so that we can then predict simulate and look at what the impact of future changes might be. The other is what can we take from macro, obser macro observations and learn about micro behavior and vice versa? What can we un learn from understanding how people actually behave in cities and how they're impacted by the built environment and what can that tell us about the city as a whole? And also conversely, kind of what can we understand about these kind of large patterns of understanding of the city and what does that tell us about individual behavior? So a lot of this comes from, in some respects, an influence also of Holly White, which uh, I'm sure everybody uh, is very aware of. Um, and we like to think about this, I mean, uh, uh, kind of came across a video of his, uh, some of his work, and it, it was just quite telling um, that he basically was imploring us to use, uh, he used the best observational tools, sensing tools at the time, which were eight millimeter cameras, but trying to understand how people actually are influenced and how they operate in public spaces. You know, how does shading, does the location of streets, how, does all of the, how do all of these things affect human behavior? So the ability now is to actually look at these kind of three big buckets of new data sources that we're starting to extract from the city and take these as a, as a tool to provide a better, more clear, and perhaps more full understanding. So these are roughly grouped. Um, people could debate about the groupings, but it's kind of irrelevant anyway. And we could think about organic data flows, which are really city records, 311 complaints, those types of things, as well as all group social media data in this. So this is data that's organically grown by city residents. Uh, there's sensor data. Of course, everybody's got a cell phone, incredible data that comes out of smartphones. But also think about easy pass as a sensor, ATM video cameras as a sensor. Um, so these are in, in kind of new data sources that have not actually been tapped into yet for perhaps purposes they weren't intended. And then there's this really interesting opportunity to take novel sensing technologies that have been prevalent in the physical sciences and apply them to cities. And this is using hyperspectral. This is using LIDAR, for instance, to understand three-dimensionality of the city. Uh, and I'll come back to some examples of this. 
But big picture, we're moving, in, especially in the kind of social science realm, which is where the study of cities has tended to land, from this spatial and temporal uh, granularity of kind of decennial annual census data, survey data at the neighborhood city scale, and being able to slide this down to more real time individual level data. And the logic of what cities can do with this is kind of well-worn territory. I think you know, the IBMs and Cisco's of the world have kind of pounded the drum about optimizing operations and physical infrastructure. But I think the greater opportunity is really to understand this dynamics of neighborhood change and really to understand and empower people who live in cities to make better decisions about the future of their own communities. You know, how do we gauge the, the community and neighborhood planning exercises in an informed way and use this technology to actually prove the thing, improve the things, improve the problems that people on the ground actually have, not what people at some com company think they have. Uh, so this is the difference, and I think this is a big challenge. And I think from the perspective of cities, certainly if you just look at a typical cross-section of a New York City street or the trying to build the new subway system in Rome, uh, we can't build our way out of the problems the way we could in the days of Howard or Le Corbusier's ideas about how we rethink the city. We have to use what we have more efficiently. And we also have to better understand what the implications of decisions are in the urban environment. The implications and the, and the potential impact of these massive policy and design decisions have tremendous ripple effects that we just don't, the kind of the traditional process is to evaluate these well after the fact, if at all, uh, and then to very slowly try to go back and think about how to correct problems if they, uh, if they emerge. But we need to understand what the impact of such a decision might be before it happens. There's a lot of data that we've been playing with that, uh, that others have been playing with as well to really begin to understand what is life like in the city and how is it change? And how can we begin to build those model parameters to be able to simulate kind of what goes on in a city? If you look at four square check-ins before and after Hurricane Sandy, this provides an interesting glimpse of what happens in life in lower Manhattan. Um, so if a city agency had nothing but this data, they could know that something was going on and they could even think to potentially respond. Using Flickr data, for instance, gives us an interesting glimpse of what people think is interesting and valuable, where tourists go and where residents go. Um, so kind of interesting example of, of how to, to apply some of this organic social media data, if you will, uh, as a way to better understand what people value in a city. And then, of course, using other ways, other ways to understand what's going on in terms of mobility in particular. This is, um, this is a, uh, represents about 300 million taxi trips in 2011. This is an interesting kind of pulse of the city, at least from the perspective of people who use taxis. But you could begin to see the effects of Hurricane Irene, of the half marathon, of Christmas, but the normal variation day to day and how it's ultimately impacted. And the implications for this for resilience uh, and for city planning and city operations are pretty tremendous. And another view of these data looking at the day before Hurricane Sandy and then seven days after to see how the city began to recover. And again, just this is for one segment of the population. I mean, I think the one thing we need to understand with these data is they are very biased in what, who we're actually looking at and, uh, and what perspective of the city we're getting. This macro to micro is also really interesting. There's a lot of discussion of a science of cities, kind of Jeff West and some of the folks out in the Santa Fe Institute are trying to understand, can we understand broader patterns of, of city life? And this is an aggregation of about 3 million Fitbit users uh, across uh, the six different cities. And what's interesting to see is we see slight variations in when people go, wake up, go to sleep, the siestas. Um, but overall, we see a rather similar curve across what we think would be very different cultural environments. So there's an application opportunity here to, to understand where are the commonalities across cities and where are the true differences. You know, what can we understand and deal with in generalized terms and what do we really need to understand in a local context? And then, of course, a lot of work that the folks have been doing and we've been doing as well in understanding 311 data and kind of trying to understand and correlate different data sets so that we could potentially predict uh, uh, problems before they occur. Uh, noise is a very popular one. The number one complaint in New York City is noise, as anyone who lives in New York City could kind of imagine. Um, but you can begin to use this as a predictor not only for crime, but also for cardiac events. You know, consistent uh, uh, exposure to noise stress uh, has implications on, on health. Uh, so this is kind of repackaging and reusing data in, in a new way to ask novel questions of it. And then I mentioned um, some, some new uh, some new novel sources, and this is something that we've been doing using remote sensing. Trying to understand, in this case, proxies for energy consumption by looking at light patterns. Uh, this is actually, uh, light patterns across, this, this is an actual image from uh, a, a location that we have on the top of our building at one Metro Tech Center in downtown Brooklyn, look, looking at Midtown. And this is actually using visual imagery to, 
look at pollution plumes. And you'll, if you'll notice, this red plume in the top picture as it emerges is actually a fuel oil uh, heater turning on um, uh, in one of the residential buildings. And you could see the plume. And then if we look at the extracted image, which is basically taking out all of the still uh, pictures, you could see this plume quite clearly. So using this type of information to understand how emissions, for instance, in real time, methane, carbon, uh, particulates, I mean, these are kind of new ways of applying sensors uh, to understand the city. And I'll get into the very specifics here of a project that we're working on with the city and with a few others, um, is this quantified community. So the idea here is taking all this data fusion and integration and using it to really understand a slice of the city at the neighborhood scale. And why is the neighborhood scale important? Well, one, it's at a scale where we can begin to instrument everything about the physical environment, understand behavior and environmental conditions so we could really understand the interactions of these. You know, what are the true impacts of a mixed-use environment? How do people actually use public space in a, in a dense urban environment? What kind, of, what kind of transportation modes are they using to get around? We could begin to understand this. And the other piece here is that's critical is that you can engage with the community to understand its problems and use the technology to better support and serve and address those problems that it, that it generates. Um, our first uh, initiative has been with uh, Related at the Hudson Yards, at Hudson Yards Development. So we're working in partnership with them to build in this instrumentation, this data management, ultimately data analytics layer, and then create this feedback to the people who will live there to be able to provide, both provide data in a kind of citizen science, participatory sensing environment, but also understand and learn from what we're doing. And transparency is critical here. So we have three big goals that we're working on. Uh, obviously build this data-enabled experimental platform in the city. Uh, you ultimately use the data so we could bench line, ben baseline and benchmark and understand how a city is, how the neighborhood's actually performing versus itself over time and versus other neighborhoods, not unlike how we begin to use uh, various wearable devices. And then also create a test bed for, for urban technologies. So there's a whole host of questions that we've been exploring, and this has been part of the more questions and answers piece um, about things that we would want to know if we could measure, if we could know anything about a neighborhood or a slice of the city, what would we want to know? Uh, and these are some things that, uh, that have come to, uh, come to be some of the priorities. Uh, I should say we started with Hudson Yards. We're now working with Downtown Alliance in Lower Manhattan, which is very exciting. I'll show some data in just a second. And we're actually just initiate work, initiating work with the Red Hook Initiative, which is incredibly exciting. They've built out a, a Wi-Fi uh, capability across Red Hook. Obviously a very different environment than Hudson Yards or Lower Manhattan. And I think one that we explicitly and critically have to think about in terms of the diversity and the impact of the technologies and how they're actually applied and who actually gets the benefit from them. So I've got a uh, little running low on time, so I'll slip through some of these to just look at some of the data that we've got. I want to give you a sense of what this looks like. This is some work that we did um, using data from Lower Manhattan. The uh, yellow pulsing are eight, uh, wireless access point pings, so devices pinging wireless access points. The blue circles that are expanding are bike share docks. The green circles that occasionally turn yellow or red are big belly solar trash cans. And the purple dots are 311 complaints. So you can begin to get a sense of kind of where people are going, how they're moving, how they're interacting with the space, when they're getting there, at least on bike share, when they start to complain, when the trash is filling up. So trying to really understand what makes the neighborhood tick, how it's actually used. And we're expanding this work now to layer in land use data, 311 complaint data. These are noise complaints for the area from the summer. Locating street trees, understanding how street trees affect air quality. Uh, for instance, and we're deploying a range of sensors, actually very low-cost Arduino-based sensors to measure noise, decibel meter level, to measure particulate matter, to measure light levels, uh, to measure humidity. Uh, and we're bringing this out there so that we could begin to answer questions like, what's the effect of a street tree in New York City? Uh, and answer that question along a, num a number of dimensions. And I think one of the things that becomes very interesting and telling, again, to this understanding the pattern of life in the city and, and ultimately how people actually use and are shaped by the built environment in which they live is this kind of wireless access point data. And these are some of the wireless access points in Lower Manhattan along Water Street. And this is just a glimpse of this from July. And the blue dots are people, are devices just passing by, not connecting. The red are people who are sitting around at an access point for longer than five minutes, and the green are people who are actually connecting to the Wi-Fi and exchanging data. But it's interesting to see the pattern, the typical pattern. You know, you have the morning spike, the lunch, the evening spike, more people hanging around at night on Thursdays. You could see the impact of what happened in July 4th weekend on activity. 
Uh, so it's very interesting, some stuff that you might immediately assume, but it's begin, really interesting to begin to understand what you could do with this level of, of detail and level of knowledge. And then another ex slip, uh, kind of example of this is looking at regulars or people who are devices that are regularly connecting versus devices that are connected for the first time. So a rough proxy of tourists. And the green are, are the kind of tourist devices. And you can see what begins to happen on, on, the, on the weekends, for instance, and how this 24-7 neighborhood begins to change, if it is, and if it's becoming that, how it begins to change over time. So as I said, there's a, this is just the beginning of a discussion. We are actively working on this and actually putting out sensors both at Hudson Yards and in Lower Manhattan. Um, but you know, there's a lot of questions that still remain about what are the true use cases here, and how can we can demonstrate the value of collecting this level of information? You know, what are the right devices? What are the right locations? How do we calibrate them effectively? And then very big questions about data privacy, data management, and operations as we're beginning to collect this data at scale, uh, and data that can be considered in some respects uh, you know, potentially sensitive data, potentially sensitive information. So questions of who owns that data, how, does it, how is it used, and how is it protected are really uh, at the forefront of our thinking. So I appreciate your time. Thank you.